Church, welcome to our worship service this morning. It is Palm Sunday, uh, which means that we are starting the countdown to Easter together as a church family. And so we are glad that you've joined us this morning from your living room or your couch or wherever it is that you're tuning in this morning. Thank you so much for joining us this week and last week. We appreciate your flexibility and we appreciated so much the comments about um, what the services have meant to you while we've been apart. One of my favorite things from last week was at the very end, and hopefully you tuned in, uh, but we got to see some updates from some of our church family and how they're doing. Today, as we join together in worship, we're going to sing, we're going to hear God's word. Nathaniel has a children's message Um, that you'll look forward to as well. And we're hoping that you'll enjoy the panel discussion that'll be hosted a little later in the service where we are talking about how we can celebrate Easter in the middle of the coronavirus. Just a couple of announcements. As reminders, there are no activities that are going to be happening on the church campus for the foreseeable future. We will announce when we will be gathering back together. Thank you for those that have joined with us on our Wednesday evening prayer meetings on Zoom. Uh, We will continue to be having those, so make sure that you check with your Sunday school teacher, check the church website, um, the Facebook page. We are making that available to you um, to join in. Zoom does require a web browser. Um, You can do it without an app, but most people that we've talked to have said that the app really helps. So plug in, join us. It's a great way for us to see each other. Um, We're encouraging Sunday school classes and groups to take advantage of Zoom during this period and have Sunday school classes, even if they're on Thursdays or something. Um, Continue to meet together. So we look forward to joining in worship today. Thanks for tuning in. God said, They called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he bled and died, to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just. 
because he lives. How sweet, how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives, but greater still, the calm assurance this child can face in certain days, because Christ lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know And life is worth the living just because he lives. And then one day I'll cross that river. I'll fight life's fight no more with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know And life is worth the living just because he lives. Good morning, EBC Kids. This morning is Palm Sunday, and I wanted to read to you out of the book of Matthew, the story of Palm Sunday, when Jesus came into Jerusalem this week before he died on the cross for us. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 9 says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble, and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the fowl of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Lord, the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. So Jesus was coming into Jerusalem and he sent his disciples into the village. And what, what did he tell them to go get? Did he tell them to go get a noble steed? Place? No. no. He, he told him to get, you know, just a little donkey and a colt. And he came in and people were laying their cloaks on the ground and they were taking palm fronds and waving them and, and putting them on the ground to be walked on. And that was Jesus coming into Jerusalem. The, his mighty triumphant entry into the city looked a lot like his entry before he was born. Mary came in to Bethlehem riding on a donkey pregnant, and Jesus was born in a barn in a stable. A lot of the Jews, even though the scripture said he would come humble riding on a donkey, the Jews thought the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was going to be a mighty warrior with a sword, riding a horse in armor. But no. he was a carpenter. He was an everyday man. He came writing little jewels here. But in a week, Jesus died on the cross. He was betrayed. He had his last supper with his disciples. 
and he was taken and he was crucified for crimes he didn't commit. But three days later, three days later, he rose from the tomb. And the tomb is empty and the grave is empty. And Jesus came back. And we're going to talk more about that story next. But I want you to remember that Jesus came to die for you and me. And he didn't come as a triumphant king. He came as a humble carpenter. And he loves you. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be tall and athletic and good looking for Jesus to love you. Jesus loves you no matter what. He came for the rich and he came for the poor. He came for the strong and he came for the weak. He came for you and he came for me. Love you guys. And I hope I'll get to see you guys soon. Until next week. Well, hopefully this week you received in the mail a little something from us at the church office. That was to do three different things. And first was we wanted you to know what we're doing in this crisis to be good stewards of what God has given to us in our financial resources. We'll let you know that there's been a, a spending freeze on discretionary expenses. Uh, at this point, we're trying to curb our utility usage so that we are able to conserve um, the resources that God has given to us uh, financially. Secondly, and the most important part of this, and, and, and this is truly um, the most important, is we wanted to know how you're doing. Um, we know it's hard with having limited physical contact to um, get with one another phys uh, in person. And so that's why we included the return envelope so that you can send um, that little contact card. We want the most recent information, updates. We want to put together an email list so that we can use that to communicate. More than anything, though, we just want to know how you're doing. We want to know how your family's doing. We want to know how we can pray for you. If there's anything we can do for you during this, uh, that's why we continue to make the Coronavirus Neighbors form available online so we can meet those needs as they come up. And thirdly, we wanted to communicate ways that you can continue to give during the crisis, um, whether that be online or mailing a check-in or dropping by during our limited office hours. Uh, to those of you who have, have given um, generously and graciously in this, we thank you so much for uh, your continued support, and we trust God to continue to meet our needs here at Emmanuel. So let me pray for us, and then we'll continue in our worship. Father, we thank you that you've met our needs. Most of all, you've met our needs through Christ. And we thank you that we have the ways through Zoom, through uh, streaming, to continue to engage with one another, that we can be a part of your kingdom, even though we're separated. So we pray that you continue to be generous and gracious to us as a church, to our families. And we pray that you would continue to do the work that you've started in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, continue in worship, church. All right, guys. Well, this is a, a first. We're trying a panel discussion um, that, that we're showing during our service. So um, coming to us all from all over the southeast are some friends of mine um, that I'm really glad to get to talk to again here. Leslie, for people not just from our church, but anyone that might be tuning into this, how, do, how, do, how should parents navigate the abnormal for kids, whether they're um, preschool age, elementary, and, and all the way through you know, high school? Right. You know, Scott, I think it starts with us calming our anxiety, um, taking time alone to get in the word and just, you know, get our heads on straight first and foremost, because um, especially our preschoolers, they can pick up on our anxiety so easily. Um, even as old as my kids are, if I were running around the house feeling anxious, worried, watching the news constantly, um, my kids would pick up on that even at their age. And so it's helpful for us to remember that we really want to put nothing but positivity into their heads. We don't want them to leave this season um, feeling anxious. We don't want them to have a season where they feel fearful of viruses or sickness or anything like that. So we want to watch that we're turning the TV off, that we're not watching and overloading ourselves, overloading them accidentally in the process. Um, you know, I shared with a friend the other day, 9-11 happened when our kids were preschoolers. And so my husband and I really, really wanted to have the news on all the time. We wanted to see what was going on because this was so new and so strange. But we had to make a conscious effort. TV went off when our kids were in the room. 
we didn't talk on the phone to the grandparents about what was going on in the news or our fears or our concerns. And, and so I think it starts with us to just calm ourselves and have peace and just rest in him. And, and then we can convey that to our kiddos. And it can be a really great season for us to invest in our kiddos, for us to not see it as a burden, for us to check our parenting and, and ways we would like to do better. And we've got that time now. So if we can get our heads on straight and be a little more positive, I think it will end up being a, a good season for all of us, um, even though financially it may not be the best and, and there are just certainly distractions around us. Um, but I think it can be a good thing if we just kind of have our heads on straight to, to begin with. So. Definitely. And I think that's, like you said, the, the strangest thing is um, just navigating the abnormal. Um, we lost Nathaniel. I'm trying, we're trying to get him back. Uh, you know, it's just navigating the abnormal. And, and I, the closest thing we can compare it to was a, a couple of years ago when we had the hurricane coming and, and we got so sucked into it. And it was just no, the big TV, the main TV is kids stuff. If we're going to watch anything, it's going to be on our phones without them around, um, just so that we didn't get them into it. But then also, like you said, just capitalizing on whether it's, you know, the unexpected time of having um, Callie home from grad school to just make the most out of these moments. Or um, as you and I texted this morning, you know, you're uh, loving that they're waking you up playing video games all night and just capital, you know, cashing in this okay. unique situation where um, we're working from home. Um, we're being asked, you know, daddy, why are you on the, uh, why are you in my room on the computer? Uh, like, the, like Daniel did, you know, just, just enjoy it. This is, this is rare. Um, and, you know, we can't pretend that everything's okay. And that's what, um, you know, we've, we've talked about, we're, our family's cooking more, we're spending more time together, we're doing more. We were already homeschooling, so, you know, everyone that was freaking out about it, like, it's okay, just don't <laughs> expect it to be like school. Be flexible, be, be mobile, um, you know. Um, you know, how do we make our worship meaningful? And I know all of our churches are probably doing some different stuff. When Nathaniel jumps back in, he'll be able to tell us a little bit about what we're doing at Emmanuel. But I know you guys at Westside are doing a drive-in um, service. Daniel, are, you know, how are you guys in, at your church making, um, and even in your family, making worship meaningful during this? Yeah, like, uh, you know, Pastor Scott, we, a lot of things that, you um, we're doing are probably pretty similar to most churches a lot of uh, I mean we're strictly online at our service that we are right now the I uh, volunteer uh, in our uh, adult discipleship ministry and our counseling ministry now and so uh, we we're got my my Mac open on the kitchen table at 10 a.m. or the kitchen table and our church had um, sent like coloring sheets in the mail. So our kids are like doing the coloring sheets and then our pastor's talking and, and preaching and there's, um, you know, and, and they're singing. And so it, it's as normal ish as you can probably get, but you know, the, the real good thing just for us is we're doing it as a family and that may sound, you know, like, do you normally not do that as family? We do, but with the ages of our kids, they're six, they're six and two. So typically our son is in the preschool ministry and our daughter is in we worship as it's called at our church. And so they're not to the age yet where they're sitting in the service. I mean, you can, if you choose to do that as a family in our church, but if you've ever had a two year old in the service before, yeah, you know, thank, thank the Lord for preschool ministries. And so, uh, uh, and, uh, and so <clears throat> for us right now, like we're, we're all around the table and that's normally not, and it's not like, it's like being out at a movie or at a uh, show with a two year old or at a restaurant because, you know, it's not the all peace and quiet. And we're all paying attention. It's like, uh, yeah, daddy, give me the orange crown now. And then, you know, Pastor Mark's preaching something on the screen. So, you know, it, it's very much in the season that we're in. But it's been good for us to sit there together because that's normally just for the ages of our kids. We don't all step into big church uh, together normally. And so that's been a unique thing. Um, and there's going to be the questions like, Daddy, we were supposed to do an Easter egg hunt at our church. We were supposed to, 
you know, so you're navigating those, those things and, and, and all that. So, but it's, it's a sweet season as a family. Um, so there. All right. Well, thank guys. Thank you so much for hanging out. I really appreciate you taking time out of your, out of your day and hopefully to church, this was a blessing to you um, as much as it was to us. So um, thanks so much. We'll continue our service. Well, thanks again for joining us for worship this morning. And as we think about what it means to follow Christ on Palm Sunday, I want us to draw our attention instead of to Sunday, to Thursday during Holy Week. Um, Thursday is the night that typically has been associated with the arrest and betrayal of Jesus. And it all happens in the context of what we understand as the Last Supper, where Christ gathers with his disciples for uh, one last meal, the institution of the Lord's Supper happens during this. Jesus gives final instructions to his followers. The book of John records specific prayers that Jesus gives for the church. And that's where I want us to, to draw our attention this morning as we think about what it means to follow Christ this week. Palm Sunday, and with it the rest of the week, pushes us to reorient our priorities in light of Easter. See, what we're talking about today with Palm Sunday, with the, the week before Christ's death, everything hinges on Easter. Everything hinges on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so for us, before the crucifixion, we have to recognize that Jesus was being viewed in this lens. And Nathaniel shared this with the children's message that the Messiah was going to come and be this conquering king who would overthrow the Romans by force. He'd, he'd ride in on a mighty steed like Old Lace, the horse. But Jesus didn't come with the mighty steed. He came on a colt, on a donkey, riding as the Prince of Peace, entering the city not as a conquering king or a tribute like the Romans so often did, but as one, a lamb being led to slaughter. And that's where Easter reorients everything for us. It reorients our priorities. It reorients our understanding. And that's what I want us to look at this morning. So if you would, join me in your copy of God's Word, whether it's in front of you uh, like this, or if it's on your screen or your computer, whatever it might be. John 13, we're going to read starting in verse 12. When he, Jesus, had washed their feet and put his outer garments on and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's as well. For I have given you an example that you should do as just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you knew these things, blessed are you if you do them. But I'm not speaking of all of you. I know who I've chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word is fulfilled in what Christ has done. Help us to see all of our life reoriented through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, I want us to look at four things that Jesus does to, to reorient our priorities in this passage. The first thing is that Jesus serving upends how we see power. So when we, we come to this passage, we see that this is in the middle of what will be known as the Last Supper. And Jesus has just ceremonially washed the feet of the disciples. His serving upends how we see power. Just like now, there are certain things that we feel like are beneath us. And, and especially in the ancient world, in this, this world where honor and shame were such a big deal, the, the role of foot washing was reserved for the least of these. Now, Full disclosure, when we were planning to do this one in person, there was going to be someone's feet who were going to get washed. The, the point is, is that 
we don't think about this in such a shameful way anymore. We see people do this at weddings. Uh, some, some churches even practice foot washing almost as an extra sacrament of something that, that's done along with baptism and the Lord's Supper as part of their regular Christian life. We don't think about the shame that this would have meant. But this was something that was reserved for the lowest of the low of the servants. And Jesus does it. The king of the universe does it. He washes the disciples' feet. He serves them. He lives out what he had said in Mark 10, 20, 1045, excuse me, that the son of man did not come to be served, meaning to be waited on, to be attended to like royalty should be. The son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for many, Jesus serving upends how we see power. It does. The Christian ethic is simple. There is nothing that is below us to do. There is nothing that is below us to take on. There's nothing that is below our pay grade. So what we see from Christ, the King, Christ the Messiah, is that power comes through serving. Power comes through serving. Influence comes through serving. Hundreds of years later, there would be a movement called servant leadership that took what Jesus said and made millions off of it. But for us as believers, we know that, that God has not called us to wait, be waited on, but to serve one another. Guys, I want to I give you some encouragement on this one that as we're doing our life in the middle of this pandemic, as we're, as we're going about our business, show kindness to those who are serving. Show kindness and generosity through the tip jar, through kind words. Take a moment, ask how they're doing. Genuinely connect. And with our neighbors, serve them. Serve our neighbors. Serve those around you. Second thing, Jesus' humility flips our own importance. Again, we cannot escape the who in this story. Who's the who? It's Jesus. It's the king. This is God taking on flesh. And how does he live? How does he serve? How does he act with humility? It flips our own importance. Because we think too highly of ourselves. More often than not, I think we do. I think we think too highly of ourselves. We esteem ourselves greater than we really are. I want to tell you a good one about that. This was several years ago when we still lived in Kentucky, and I had just gotten doctored. It's a really big deal. They put this hood on you. You get your picture taken with Dr. Moeller. It's really cool. And they give you this fancy piece of paper that says doctor on it. And it's got your name. It's kind of, it, I, I, was, I was proud of it. So anyway, so I, I, I get that. I, I get a frame, a fancy frame to put it in. And I hang it on the wall in my office. At the time, Sam was attending our church's preschool, and, and in the afternoon, he'd come down. I'd pick him up. He'd come down to the office while I was working, and I'd take him home at the end of the day. Well, this particular day, they had done some macaroni art, and Sam wanted to show it off, and he asked if he could hang it in my office. And, of course, I said yes. If you've ever been to my office, it's a shrine to the kids. They've got artwork and drawings and notes and, and Legos everywhere. And so he's looking for a place to hang this macaroni art. And I've got tons of things he could hang it on, like extra random nails and screws sticking out of the out of the block. Well, where does he put it? He hangs it on the doctoral diploma. In that moment, God showed me what humility is. That to me, this diploma that represented years of work and a and a year of writing, for my son, it was a place to hang macaroni art. And for all of us, I think we need that reminder sometimes. Jesus' humility flips our own importance. Look at Philippians 2 sometimes, especially verses 5 through 11, that talks about that though he was God, he did not count equality with God something to be grasped. So, so Jesus made himself nothing, emptied himself, withdrew his divine prerogative, and became a servant, became poor, gave himself away, 
if there's anyone who recognizes their own importance, it should be Christ, who is God in flesh, who Colossians tells us is the one, the agent by which everything was created. That's who Jesus is. So this man sitting at the table is the only one in the room who has claim to importance. And what do we find him doing? We find him wrapping himself back up in his clothes that he had used to wash the disciples' feet. Didn't throw the towel in the wash. He put the towel back on. Christ shows us what it means to flip our own importance and for us to recognize what humility truly means. It's not that we beat ourselves up, but that we recognize who we are compared to him. And if he emptied himself, why don't we? Third thing, Jesus' sacrifice changes our understanding of love. We like to think of ourselves as loving people. We love our spouses. We love our families. We love our community. We love lots of things. And we show that love in a number of different ways. We buy our our spouse flowers. We buy gifts. We um, tell each other that we love one another. We hug. But that's weird because we can't do that now. So we fist bump or we elbow bump or we just kind of wave from six feet or more away, which is totally fine for introverted people like me who don't like to hug. But I know some of you, you're really having a hard time with this one. And I want you to know that you're not alone and that when we get through this, you can give me a hug and I'm not going to clench up. I'll I'll let you give me a hug. Um, but for most of us, we, we, we express love in all of these different ways that are good, right, and true. We should tell each other that we love one another. We should buy gifts for our spouse. We should shower our kids with affection, even when it embarrasses them. Oh, and I can't wait till it does that. We're going to give those kids hugs and kisses and, and pinch their cheeks when they're 13, 14 years old. Sam, I know you're watching this. Just wait, buddy. It's going to be here before you know it. We love one another, and we should show that. But here's the thing. The cross changes our understanding of love. And this is how it relates to Palm Sunday. When when Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem, the crowds were waiting for him. They laid palm branches down. They cried Hosanna. They cheered and celebrated the champion coming home, the hero coming, the prince of peace arriving. And and Zechariah talks about these messianic prophecies connected to the coming of the king into Jerusalem and that he wouldn't come on the war horse, but that he would come on the donkey, that he would come as the prince of peace. And Christ does that. But all of it is bracketed, is enveloped in what happens not on Palm Sunday, not on the cleansing of the temple, or in any of the other acts that Jesus did in Jerusalem during his last week on earth. No, all of it changes on Friday. All of it changes on Friday because that's when we recognize and that's when we realize what love truly means. Jesus had hinted at this in his ministry where he said that no greater love has anyone than he who lays down his life for his friends. And at the time, I don't think the disciples knew what he was talking about, but Jesus was alluding to the crucifixion even then, that all of this was going to end with a cross. And on the cross, Jesus would show the love that he has. Love is more than feeling. Love is more than thinking. Love is more than action. Love is more than affections. Love is sacrifice. Everything about the love of God hinged on a cross that the sacrifice of Christ, which is alluded to through this, where he talks about the servant's not greater than the master, the messenger's not greater than the one who sent him. Jesus is showing that he is coming on God's behalf as the agent of salvation, that Jesus is the one who's going to bring about hope because of a cross. The last thing is that Jesus' grace undoes our concepts of justice. We've seen the painting by da Vinci. How many people are at the table? There's 13. Jesus and the 12 disciples. One of those disciples was Judas. 
and when it talks about him washing their feet, there's no exclusionary clause. There's no, and Judas was running late, or Judas had, had, had come in after the foot washing started. No, the grace of God is on display that Jesus washed Judas's feet. Jesus' grace undoes our concepts of judgment. He is our teacher and our Lord. And what he does, we mimic. We follow. If he's our Lord, we'll do what he said. If he's our master, we'll obey. If he's our teacher, we'll learn from him. And what Jesus does is Jesus displays a complete reorienting of our priorities. Because at the end of this, we realize that his grace trumps our concepts of judgment. The grace of Christ outweighs our measure of sin and judgment. We don't know where you are spiritually while you're watching this one. We don't know if you're tuning in by accident, if you're trolling our Facebook page, if you happen to come across this. The message that we have this Palm Sunday, the message that, that the gospel has, the, that Jesus has, is that grace outweighs our sin. Whatever it is that you brought with you to this broadcast, Jesus is enough to cleanse it, to forgive it, to wash it away, because his grace outweighs our measure of sin and judgment. We wouldn't have washed Judas' feet if we knew what he was going to do. I get mad at movie characters when I know how they're going to act later, when I see them in the beginning, especially if it's a movie I've seen before. And all of this is because of Easter. Palm Sunday by itself is a, is a wonderful day. It's a great day to celebrate the coming of Jesus to Jerusalem, the hosannas that were sung. But without Friday and without the next Sunday, it's an incomplete story. So that's why we want you to tune in next week. Next week is Easter, and it's going to be different. We're not going to be able to do like we usually do for Easter, and we're kind of bummed about that. Actually, we're not kind of bummed. We're really bummed about that. We really miss gathering with our church family. But we hope you'll join us next week for Easter Sunday when we shout, Christ lives, Jesus is alive. That's the hope of the resurrection, the hope of Easter. It starts on Palm Sunday. Thanks so much for joining in with us today. We hope you're blessed. We hope you and your family are doing well. And if there's anything that we as a church can do, please let us know. We love you guys. Bye. This time, will you join me in singing This I Believe?
I believe in life eternal I believe in the virgin birth I believe in the saints communion And in your holy church I believe in the resurrection When Jesus comes again For I believe in the name of Jesus For I believe I believe in the name of Jesus. Hi, church family. Greetings from the Adams and Hefner household. We are here all doing well, all healthy and thankful for that. Uh, we sure do miss our church family a lot. We really can't wait to get back in church together so I can hug everybody in person. Um, I've got Mom and Park here with me. We're going to get a little message from them as well. Hello, everybody. Uh, missing everybody, but just thankful that we haven't heard of any of our members that have been sick or anything, but just continue to stay inside mm -hmm. and do what we're supposed to do that way and do our part. And uh, just just remember that in, in the midst of all of this other stuff, when we wake up every morning, we just need to say that, uh, this is a day that the Lord has made, and let us be happy and rejoice in it. See you soon. Amen. And now here's a word from Park. Probably just one word. I don't know what to follow that up with. So, <laughs> I miss playing the bass. I miss seeing the people. And, hello. <laughs> That's about it from us, and we hope you're all doing well, and can't wait to see you soon. Love you guys. Bye. Bye-bye.